Seeking mental health care can be overwhelming and even scary, but it doesn't have to be. I'm Dr. Josephine McNary, and I'm committed to making this process easier for you. Each week, my expert guest and I unravel a different form of therapeutic intervention in order to bring comfort and understanding and to help you get back to your true self. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Mind Stories. Today, I'm pleased to have on as our guest, Dr. Robin Berman. Dr. Berman is an associate professor of psychiatry at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. She's the author of Permission to Parent, How to Raise Your Child with Love and Limits, which was also published in Europe under the title, Hate Me Now, Thank Me Later. She has appeared on the Today Show and Good Morning America, and her book has been featured in the Washington Post, the London Times, and Time Magazine Online. She is a founding board member of the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital at UCLA and an advisor advisory board member of Matthew McConaughey's Just Keep Living Foundation. She is also on the Parent Magazine Advisory Board, is a regular contributor to Goop.com, and had a podcast recently featured on the Hello Sunshine website. Today, we talk more about how parents can honor their children's feelings while still being captain of their family ships. Her goal is to inspire parents to be their best selves so they can be the best parents possible. Welcome, Dr. Berman. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So today is an exciting topic um, because I think a lot of people will find this very interesting um, given the fact that you are an expert in parenting. (laughs) There is no such thing as a parenting expert, but I'm just so curious to hear more about your insights about parenting and hear a little bit more about your book as well. Sure. I I laugh about the parenting expert because we're all expert in quotations because Really, we're all stumbling our way through. Parenting is very messy. There's no right way. And I think that actually gets in people's way when they think, oh, I did that wrong. I did that right. I did. And then there's a lot of judgment as opposed to curiosity. Hmm, how should I handle this? You know, even looking at your children, I try and look at my children more with curiosity. I wonder why they did that versus why did you do that? Right. You know, so, so I, I, the the whole concept of a parenting expert, my original um, title of my book, as we were discussing was hate me now, thank me later in Europe. If you go to Europe, anywhere in Europe, it's hate me now, thank me later. And we got to the United States and they were like, hate, you can't use the word hate. So there's a real hyper um, consciousness around parenting that maybe went a little too far, right? You know, we can laugh at ourselves as we know. Donald Winnicott, the psychiatrist and pediatrician said you only had to be a good enough mother. He didn't say you had to be a perfect mother. He said you had to be good enough. And in that allows for so much mistake making and messing up and excuse me, can I have a mommy do over? You know, what I meant to say was, or excuse me, can I have a mommy do over? My volume was a little bit higher than I wanted it to be. That in those moments of rupture, as we know, as psychiatrists, there's repair. And in that repair is intimacy and really seeing your child and really knowing your child. So that's being mindful. That's being reflective. You know, how, why am I so keyed up about what my kid did? Oh, this reminds me of when my mother did this to me. That's the whole reflective, Where where's the trigger? Where's the volume coming from, from the past? One of my favorite psychiatry, I trained in Chicago. I don't know if we've got it at UCLA, but it was um, hysterical is historical. Have you ever heard that at UCLA? No? Okay. So when the volume's so high on our parenting or with our partner or with anybody, it's about our history. Right. So if it feels like there's a little bit of rational anger around something, that's when you just take a look back. And there's usually a tie back to your parents or the way you were treated. Lots of times I see that when I do parenting consultations with couples, there's just so charged about something kind of benign and it feels really malignant. And then it's like, oh, let's look back. And it's, oh, my father did that. And there's a trigger from the past. So that that's the whole concept of reflection. Right. Looking back. So I wonder just for the audience, how as a psychiatrist, did you kind of find your way to this specialty in parenting and consulting with parents on their parenting? Great question. Multifaceted, I'll give you a short answer. One, I wanted to be a pediatrician or a child psychiatrist because I loved children. When I did my residency, I did six months of pediatrics, then changed to child psych. And I had I was frustrated that I had a little girl who's pulling out her eyelashes and the mom, and she was like, I don't know, five or six. And the mom was saying, she's not getting check pluses. She's only getting checks. And I'm like, 
wait a minute here. In order to help the kid, I actually have to help the parent. It's top down. So that was like the first aha moment. And then we worked together at the Women's Life Center and you saw a lot of postpartum moms with a lot of new mommy questions. Um, and then the truth is the real one, since the podcast was very deeply personal, I married a man who was a widower at 32 and he raised a child on his own. And when I showed up, my oldest son was very entitled, very spoiled, and had so much power and was ruling the roost. I don't do dishes. I was like, you do now. I don't clear plates. I don't make beds. I'm choosing where we're going for dinner. And I'm like, oh my goodness, <laughs> right? We got to, you know, hate me now, thank me later, <laughs> right? We're gonna, which I actually often said to him, you know, to one day on a shrink's couch, you can tell me, you can tell him I taught you values. You can tell him I taught you work ethics. You know, we, there's a story in the book, which is actually a permission parent, my son, where, where he wanted a bathing suit that was entirely too expensive for, for a 10 year old. And we were going back and forth. I'm like, summer is about to be done. You know, we're having this whole conversation. And I was like, one day you can look back and say, oh, my mom taught me values. Right. You know, I'm okay with that. And I think parents today are not comfortable saying no. So in seeing my turnaround in my own home, in really seeing how limits calmed him down, and they, it just, he just was so anxious when I met him because everything was a negotiation. You know, it was an hour to get to bed, an hour to discuss where I was like, oh, this is exhausting for, for my husband, but for sure for him, it wasn't in service to him. And I interviewed Marianne Williamson for my book. And she said, just a statement that struck me, often love says no. Love says no. And just that frame on, it is loving to say no. I know you want to stay up, sweetheart, but bedtime's eight. Or I know you want to have that ice cream cone, but we're not having it before. It's the right thing to do, but we've become this generation of pleaser parents wanting to befriend our kids instead of, it's not our job to please them, our job is to parent them. And often they're two very different things. And parents say they want to be really loved and they want to be the buddy as opposed to being respected and honored. Um, and it's much more comfortable when there's a clear hierarchy where you're in charge and no doesn't begin a negotiation. I mean, I have parents in my office all day long calling it someone yesterday, a, a bedtime ordeal, right? A nighttime. It's, it, it's every week I have someone saying, you know, it's an hour and a half dance to get my kid. And I go in and I'm like, I'm, I'm tired listening to this. And then the kid comes in and they go down. Really clear limits at the beginning around sleep, right? Grow. We know they grow a better, stronger brain, right? I shouldn't say better, a bigger, strong brain, right? Because you're sleeping and your neural pathways are forming. And this interrupted sleep that parents think they're being nice by, you know, oh, my kid gets the cuddle, he's upset in the middle of the night. Just some really clear rules. You go to bed, you, uh, you know, I'm not sort of not feeling well, you stay in your bed and you wake up, clear rules around eating, Everything becomes a negotiation. Parents are a short order cook. Your kid doesn't like pasta. You know, the salmon, you're making the pasta. I'm like, when did you become a short order cook, right? Like they can eat around what they don't like. And here's, so if I could wave a flag, a wave a flag to parents, and, and this would apply to my own parenting. Your job is to be an emotion coach. You're a brain sculptor and to tolerate distress. Whoever says that when you become a new parent, like tolerate the distress of your child without jump. Oh, oh, you're upset about this. You got a bad grade. Let me call the teacher. Uh, let me, you know, let's. Uh, how are you going to solve the problem? What are you going to do about it? We've made ourselves so involved in every helicopter detail that they've lost self efficacy. And the cry of toddlerhood is, I do it myself. They're right. Let them, let them do it, right? Don't do for a child what they can do for themselves. But we think we're helping and, and we're, we're unintentionally hurting. And I'm sure you've seen that in your world. Yeah. Right? And when you talk about this, I think of the, I, I just think of hyperactive parenting. <laughs> I think of yes. that. Yes. Is, yeah, it's like there's this frenetic energy to parenting and pleasing. And I guess what yeah. I was wondering is how did this happen? 
we so it's so interesting. I love frenetic parenting because kids vibe off your energy and they're vibing off the frenetic, which is probably a lot of the rates of depression and anxiety are higher than in World War II. So we're at a just a pan, a, just an epic mental health crisis in kids. How did it happen? I think, and I'm much older than you. So when I grew up in the '70s, kids were seen and not heard. Go out and play. We would ride our bikes at five and six, like you know hours away from home and then come home at night and, you know, show up right when dinner was kid. My parents had no idea where we were. There was no tracking devices. There were no call me when you get there. There was nowhere to call when you get there. Right. It, it was put the money in the coin and they didn't even bother asking to do that. So that benign neglect, right. As I call it, which we, we all became very resentful of. Oh, you didn't even know where we were. You didn't even care about us. Right. We overcorrected for that, as as trends do. We we swung from that to hyper parenting and helicopter parenting and snowplow parenting, clearing the path for the kid, as opposed to guiding the kid through a bumpy path. Very different skill set, you know. As we see in mental health, right? Distress tolerance, tolerating difficult feelings. What are kids? What are tenants of mental health? Being able to pivot. Oh, that didn't work out for me. I'm going to bounce back up. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm in a, I'm really upset today. How I'm going to manage my upset feelings. Positive psychology, which I've been really studying, um, uh, Seligman, Martin Seligman. Positive psychology isn't really about making a kid happy. It's actually about tolerating difficult situations. How did you explain to yourself that you failed on that test? Did you say, oh, no problem. I'll do it better the next time I I didn't now I know I need to study da, da, da. or do you say I suck I'm stupid right those are the things that actually create happiness bouncing back from life's difficulties so you know do you tell your kids wow nice pivot well done I love the way you bounce back up we treat our kids like they're fragile pieces of glass that they need all of this hovering and we give them the message you can't handle it without me right I have parents holding onto the back of the bike, wiping their children's bottoms when the kids can wipe their own bottoms, blowing their noses for them. I mean, into ages I won't even admit because they feel like they're being good parents, right? They're, oh, I'm being there for my kid. Whereas sometimes being a good parent is zipping your mouth, right? You know, zipping your mouth, zipping. I mean, I with teenagers too, it's like we should tattoo shh on our wrists, you know, like, when in doubt, stay out. When in doubt, stay out. Watch. My favorite, when I wrote Permission to Parent, I interviewed a million teachers. And one of my favorite interactions to watch was a little girl who was in preschool and she had, she's trying to zip her coat and she had a little like purse or bag. And then she had an art project and she was trying to like figure out, she was trying to zip the thing with the art project and the, per, and the preschool teacher rather than jumping in said, just watch. She's like, oh, you're trying to zip your coat. She just narrated. I was thinking, girl's not going to zip her coat. She's got a purse. She's got an art project. She's not going to build her. And so then we continue to talk. She let it go on 10 minutes. And then her next comment was, oh, do you need a suggestion? And the little girl's like, "Mm, no. And then five more minutes, she puts down the purse. She puts down the art project. She zips her coat and she looks at it. She goes, I did it myself. Right. And there it is, right? But we interrupt the arc of self-efficacy. We interrupt that beautiful arc of struggle and frustration and how I'm going to, and nine out of 10 parents, probably 99, including myself back in the day would have zipped up the coat, right? Oh, here, let me help you, right? And so helpful sometimes is being not so helpful. You know, but anxious kids, I own my office, the parents, they're looking for reassurance. Should I do this? Should I do this? Should I do that? I'm like, what do you say? I'm like, oh, I say definitely do this. I'm like, why is that? Beats me. Right. It's such a different intervention. And the last thing I'm going to say is the vibing off your energy. In Permission to Parent, I wrote, stop talking. You're talking too fast and too much and talking over floods the nervous system. So I always use the massage example. When we as physicians and mothers, right, get a massage, you want someone to just to, I'm never happy when, oh, how's the weather? How's the traffic? How are you doing? How, oh, 
versus someone just says, hi, puts the lavender under your nose, quiet, rubbing your back. My pulse goes down. Same for kids. Be the massage therapist with the lavender on your nose. You can just be a holding tank for the distress. We can't fix it anyway. I mean, we know we can't fix it anyway. That's the jig is up. Like, how can we really fix that they didn't get invited to the party? How could we really fix that a kid was mean to them on the playground? How could we really fix that they flunked their test? You know, you agree? Yeah. And it makes me wonder, because I think about parents that you, I'm, I'm curious about the consultations that you do and the kind of themes that often come up, which we're already talking about a little bit. But I wonder if a lot of times during your consultations, parents say, yeah, this makes sense. But where is the line between over-attentiveness and neglect? Yeah, I, I would I would definitely skew. I, I think neglect in this age is really hard. And obviously when we were in med school, we saw horrific, real neglect. I mean, horrific neglect. And we're not talking about them at all. I'm talking about the helicopter coming down for a landing, you know, and letting go of the bicycle. So in my book, literally, I was interviewing in a preschool and there was a biking expert. But the, oh, they call him Bike Whisperer. And I was like, what's that? And I was just curious, like, oh, these, this is the man who teaches kids how to ride bikes. I was like, oh, parents don't teach kids how to ride bikes. And I'm like, oh, they're having trouble letting go of the bike. Yeah. And so they're holding on and saying, you know, I've got you. You're not, and am I going to fall? No, I'm not going to fall because I'm not letting go. Well, then you can never ride the bike, right? So this journey toward allowing your kids the space to mess up, to fall down, to, and to make mistakes allows them not to be scared of them. But we're kind of treating mistakes like a hot potato that needs to be as opposed to a step. In, in in the direction you want to go. Oh, that didn't work. That I didn't that that didn't work out. So I'm gonna try it different the next time. But we're fearful about the other thing is I think the anxiety post 9-11, so interesting. A million uh, heads of school that I interviewed principals were saying after 9-11, anxiety and parents got up and parenting turned into product development. Oh, if I get my kid to be a star soccer player, I'll get a scholarship and his life is good. Or if I get my kids straight A's through 17 tutors, they're going to have a guaranteed pass to, but wouldn't that be nice? Right. What does, you know, parenting is a big wiggly line. It's, there's no straight line to the end. And the wiggly, it's, it's not about taking off the edge. It's about negotiating the edge, right? You can't take away the edge. So I think so, so much of what I see in my office is not, there's nowhere near the neglect. I get the super mindful parents, which is awesome. They are super mindful. And then they get a little anxious about a right way. And we know in anxiety that when you say words like, that's not right, that's wrong, that's not right, it, it's dysregulating. It's emotionally dysregulated and not instructive. That's all right. Well, what did I learn? Nothing, right? Oh, you could try it this way or you're climbing a tree. Be careful. Well, that's just my anxiety, right? Is be careful helpful? Is it instructive? How about, oh, you know, there's a big branch or there's a big step there, you know, instructive versus just projecting our own anxiety onto our kids. I see a lot of that and a lot of wonderful parents who take the note and, and change and their kid's anxiety goes down. Yeah. Right. So do you ever go into the homes or do you mainly just so kind of funny? I just did that recently. I went back to my pediatric training and my old child psychiatry training as they have a home visit. I have only done one recently because I was stumped on uh, normally it's very clear what's happening. I was stuck on what was really going on for the child. Crazy helpful, crazy helpful to do that. Because you just see the whole thing inside too, and you see you know, exactly what's happening and, and wh where you need to tweak. So, I, and I love kids. So as I said, I was going to be a pediatrician. So, and anytime I can talk to, I speak toddler. I'm not fluent in Spanish, you know, uh, you know, I wish I was, but I, I do speak toddler. It's my, it's my only fluent language. <laughs> I'm also just thinking about kind of what you do and in a way it seems, I mean, I, I mean, it seems like you have a great job because people who come to you already know kind of what they want. And it, I can see you as this coach of like, yes, let's get there. 
and let's shape how you think about things. And maybe, you know, the way you're thinking about that, maybe if you change it a little bit, it actually might be easier for you. And it's so people who come to see you for this consultation are already in a sense, kind of already feeling like they want to change. Yes. Yes. And though I'd say that's a vast majority. So it's very fun because people who want to change insight is not enough, but it sure is the starting point. And then second, as we know, is changing behavior. So the only time I got tripped up was somebody flew in from Europe to see me um, after seeing me do something in Australia and from well, like a book promo thing. And he was like, I have on a, an hour on your market said, go, my kid's lying, fix it. And I was like, oh, wow, pressure's on, right? My kid's lying. My kid's lying. And I said, do you lie? And he's like, this isn't about me. What do you mean? Oh, oh, I feel like time's wasting. I was like, do you lie? And well, you know, maybe, you know, about a parking space. I say I'm a doctor, an ER doctor, so I get out earlier at a concert. Or maybe my kid's younger, so he gets a cheaper price on a menu. Or I'll tell someone I have a headache. I don't want to go to their party. So we really talked about, oh, you have to be the lesson before you teach the lesson. If you want kids who don't lie, you actually have to be impeccable with your word Mm -hmm. because kids have bionic ears, right? They hear everything. They're breathing the dynamic of your marriage. They're breathing your values. You know, you could say, tell the truth. And then they hear you say, oh, we're not going to the party. I'm telling them I have a headache. Gone, right? Oh, my mom lies must be okay right so a lot of it which is really fun is the tweaking of the parents right the tweaking of the parents. i just was on a lecture from uh, eli Leibowitz from yale who does a lot of the uh, real anxious kids and they have a six-week program for the parents and when they treat the parents after six weeks the kids don't need to be treated anymore mm-hmm. and that goes full circle back to why I didn't become a child psychiatrist when the mom was saying my kid needs a check plus I was thinking I got to start start there and that's the beauty is there's so much you can do as parents and when you tweak a little of it right it makes and the frenetic it's like vibing off your energy so I had a parent I'll tell his story I love kids anxious to go to bed anxious to go to bed anxious to go to bed I told him the massage story like he's talking well there are no monsters there are no monsters I was like oh really the kid thinks they're monsters so deny and I'm scared you're not scared there are no monsters well denying feelings doesn't really make them go away wouldn't it be nice if you could just say stop being scared you're not cold you're not hungry the freaking thing things we tell our kids like they're like really you know I'm cold you can Tell when I'm hungry or whatever. And so this guy with the kid was so anxious and he became more anxious and talking faster. And I'm like, just see if he can stop talking so long. So he went into the kid's room and he just put his hand on the kid's heart. I'm really nervous. And he's like, mm-hmm. I get it. I'm like, what happened? The kid fell sound asleep, right? Because we're an emotional container. We're holding those feelings. And if we look anxious and are talking past and there's no this, no, we're stressed. We're giving them a high frequency stress out, right? And they're vibing off our energy. So we want to just take it down, right? Take it down to, I was just in Cabo. I'm picturing watching the sunset, you know, just take it down to that. And they feel it. Right. Yeah. Well, I love, I love your stories. <laughs> And it makes me <laughs> my parenting. Um, and it also makes me think about, I was just thinking as you're talking about kind of this calmness, right? And that's something, if you have a calm parent, you're more likely to have a calm child. Mm-hmm. And it really is kind of a self-examination. Parenting is hard and you really kind of, you're being watched and, you know, it really, it, it kind of strikes these kind of insecurities and wounds from the past in terms of kind of this overcompensation. I mean, it's complex. Yes. Yes. Uh, my mom, you know, so many people in my office will say, you know, I was always the last to be picked up. I'm, I mean, I've heard this 10,000 times. My mom never showed up at school. My dad never showed up to any of my stuff and they will not miss an event. So, you know, they've overcorrected, right? Oh, well, we have a business meeting and you're head of a company, you know, we can't, you know, what one game of not seeing baseball is actually okay. But it's, oh, I'm not going to be there. It's a, you know, sort of a meeting. I'm sure you'll do great without me. So, so much of that, you know, detox from anxious parenting is rather than fixing it. It's like, 
validating the feelings, big, big validator, name it to tame it. I get you are so nervous and I know you got this. The vote of confidence. You're good. You don't need me. You know, I get you're nervous to go to the house with dogs. I so, so get it. And, you know, and I, I know that you'll be fine. Whatever, whatever. So it's the vote of confidence. That part is big. That part is big. Right. And I also think about this overcompensation and kind of the seventies parenting style, like what type of parenting suggestions would you give those types of parents? I guess, as I'm, I'm wondering. Well, I think that's why I wrote permission parents funny, because I was like, in between these two extremes is grace. There is a graceful middle here between what happened was our parents only held the line, go to bed, they had no problem hitting, screaming, shaming. You know, that was part of the culture that, you know, you're grounded, you're this. So it was very black and white parenting. They had no problem holding the line, which is, it depends on how you hold the line. You know, I'm all about holding line, but with some grace. But the, this generation is all about holding the feeling, right? Go to bed. This year, oh, don't feel like going to bed. Oh, what's going on? Let me get you a glass of water. Oh, tell me more. Oh, you're, you're feeling sad. Oh, did the, they're holding the feeling, that, that generation and held the line. And the middle is holding both, validating the feeling and holding the line. We lost the line. We threw out the baby with the bathwater. I mean, we lost the line here. It's an hour and a half tap dance for parents to get their kids, but it's the holding the line wasn't wrong. It wasn't wrong to say no. It's how you say no. I don't believe in hitting. I don't believe in shaming. I don't believe in any of those ways of holding the line. But there's, if you validate the feeling, I get you want to stay up. I see you. I hear you, I'm with you, diffuses the nervous system, right? And then, and bedtime is 7.30, right? Good night, right? And when we're clear, so my husband wasn't clear because he felt guilty that his wife died and this big, poor baby didn't have a mom. And so anytime the kid wanted something, he'd say, okay, let's stay up a little longer. Or, okay, you don't want to do your homework. Okay, let, he had this pleaser parent thing going on. And what he didn't realize was, creating more and more anxiety and less and less self-efficacy. So the graceful middle, honor the feeling, hold the line, honor the feeling, hold the line, and validating. Parents skip validating, right? We psychiatrists were like, we get that. That must be so hard. You're feeling depressed. You just lost your mother. You know, we take the moment to say the name it to tame it, to say the feeling. Parents, when a kid steals a toy in a, in a playground from the other kid, what, what does a parent say? Give it back. Nobody narrates, oh, you both want the same toy. Really good preschool teachers do that. It's so cool to watch for me as a psychiatrist because I love it. Oh, you both want the same toy. What are you going to do about it? And they sit back and let them get the tools to work it out versus give it back. It's his turn. He kind of destroyed the arc, that arc we're talking about of beginning, middle, and then end. we kind of jumped in and it's, and it's hard as parents. We love our kids more than life itself. And we're also irrational. So the guy who his kid lied, he's like, my kids could be on America's most wanted, right? We go from zero to a hundred. Your kid lies on America's most wanted, you know, we can, you know, oh, they're, you know, they, they kicked a girl in the playground. They're never going to date, you know, like whatever crazy town crap goes through our mommy and daddy brains, right? It's out of love. You know, we're a little irrational because we love them so much. Another thing parents classically, classically do is they talk rational to someone emotionally. It is so fun. Oh, I'm feeling bad. There's no reason to feel bad. Oh, I'm having the worst day. You you didn't have a bad day. You had a good day. We just came back from school and your teacher said you did that. That's crazy, right? But we do it all day long. We talk. We, it's hard to hold the field for any of us, even psychiatrists, yeah. right? Even psychiatrists. I'm kind of going back to thinking about the preschool teachers, about how they are just a good preschool teacher is the best parenting coach ever. <laughs> Well, honestly, that's why I went to interview them. I started at the preschool level and then I went into the kindergartner arena and I just saw them. So one kindergarten teacher this at a kind of fancy privileged elementary school rang the bell and it was like stuff all over the floor, pain. And the, and the kid just heard the bell go, this old boy, and just bolted over all the mess and left. 
And the teacher was like, oh, sweet angel, what what are we missing? What, 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 let's take, and the kid's like, oh, oh, and he starts putting this stuff away. And I said, how did you do that? And she's like, well, in my head, I'm really thinking, do you have a nanny at home who's picking up after you? Like, why do you not? Like, I'm like, you're thinking that? So that's where I came up with this. Your inner monologue has to be filtered to be heard in a different way. To what you think and what you say as parents are not simpatico. You can have a party in your head about my spoiled brat. I do so much for my kid and he can't even make his bed. Have a party in your home head. But rather than saying, you lazy, selfish son of a whatever, you didn't make your bed, you want to say, oh, it's really important we keep our room clean. It lands so differently. You know, language is such a part of good parenting and volume. The volume is a part of good parenting. Like you say, they vibe off of frenetic energy. Those little neural pathways are like branches on a tree. The brain sculptor part of parenting is they're marinating on how you treat your spouse. They're marinating on how you treat the person at the grocery store. Oh, well, nice to see you again. You know, they're taking note of all of it. So it's really an opportunity to raise ourselves. Yeah. That's that's the cool part of parenting, right? You get to raise ourselves before we raise our child. Well, I really appreciate your time and your expertise. And I, I just, I think this is probably going to be, it was helpful for me. I think it's going to be helpful for the listener and just kind of little, just pearls of wisdom that you're, you're sharing in terms of just how to go about parenting. Um, do any last words before we say goodbye? Um, good question. I'll, I'll end with where I always end with in a, in a talk, which is a little boy, a little boy drew a picture of himself really big and a little tiny child next to him. And when I asked, Oh, is that your, is that your baby brother? And he said, no, that's my mom. And he had drawn it. And I was like, wow, he feels central, grandiose, large, whatever. And he had drawn hearts between his mother and him. He said, my mom and I are really close. She looks at me with hearts in my eyes. And that's why I'm so big. And I was just like out of the mouth of babes, right? So that just without judgment, because when, when we're judging, we can't love, right? So to just be curious rather than judgmental and find the, the path to faith versus fear. Like, oh, my kid's going to be a liar. Oh, my kid's never going to have a relationship. Oh, my, just be in the moment. They're little. Everything changes, right? They're growing. And just that love goggles, that love frame, I think, is super, super helpful. As opposed to the anxious frame, which we all feel as parents, right? (laughs) We'll land those helicopters. Anyway, thank you so much for having me. So lovely talking to you. Yeah, well, I'll make sure um, information about your book is on the episode description. So if the listener wants to learn a little bit more about your book or read it, they, they will know where to find it. Right. Thank you so much. Thanks. Take care. This has been Mind Stories. With remote appointments in California and nine offices throughout Southern California and the Bay Area, Cal Psychiatry specializes in medication management, mood and anxiety disorders, alternative therapies, women's mental health, and more to help you get back to your true self. Visit us at calpsychiatry.com. Thanks for listening to Mind Stories, and don't forget to subscribe. Subscribe.